Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 43. I'm really pleased to share this episode with you today because it's a chance to introduce you to one of my dear friends, someone I respect and love and the person who actually gave me my start at leading nature journaling workshops. I'm going to introduce you to my friend Andy Curry. I met Andy when he reached out to me on Instagram because he liked what I was doing with nature journaling and he thought it matched well with what he was doing, teaching bushcraft. It turns out that he lived in the same small village as I do and was running bushcraft sessions locally. I signed up and took my son along to a session. My boy was only one year old at the time. And the community and the connection that we found there was so beautiful. I'll let Andy explain to you what we mean by bushcraft in case that's not something, not a term you're familiar with. Anyway, after a short while, Andy invited me to do a nature journaling workshop for the bushcraft group, and that was my start teaching nature journaling. He had much more faith in me than I had in myself. I was so nervous in the beginning, and I was blushing like a beetroot. I can't explain to you how nervous I was. I am an introvert, and I was not at all used to public speaking or teaching, I honestly chose my courses at university depending on whether or not I had to give presentations. I would deliberately choose classes that didn't require me to be in front of the group. This isn't something that comes naturally to me at all. But anyway, I did the session for Andy and he was there just smiling and encouraging me all the way. I didn't need to feel nervous. It was such a wonderful experience. And I will always remember how Andy's belief in me started me down this path of teaching nature journaling, which is now one of my life's biggest joys. Listening to this conversation again, I realize that there might be some Australian words that need explaining to an international audience. We refer a couple of times to putting a billy on. A billy is a metal container that you suspend over a fire to boil water to make tea. Andy also mentions damper, which is a very simple bread made on a fire and often goes together with billy tea. Um, I think Andy mentions bush tucker, which is food native to Australia that's traditionally used by Indigenous Australians. And actually, when we refer to the bush, we don't mean a particular bush, but it's just a term to describe a natural or forested area in the landscape. When I was listening to the recording, I heard some sulphur-crested cockatoos screeching in the background, which happens quite often when I record podcasts in the mornings. Sometimes I edit out the screeches, but because this is a very Australian-themed episode, I left them in. So if you hear some weird screeching noises, that's what that is. The sound quality on the interview isn't the greatest, and the sound drops out in places on Andy's side. I did my best to clean it up, but sometimes you won't be able to catch everything that he says in places. But this interview means so much, and so we will go with what we have. Let's listen. Andy, thank you so much for being here with me. It's a pleasure, and I'm so looking forward to this. Yeah, likewise, Bethany. Thanks for yeah, taking the time to find me. <laughs> <laughs> so often I start from the beginning and with my guests, I ask them about early nature experiences and I'd love to hear about nature in your childhood. Um, my childhood, I grew up in York in North England, which is um, a wonderful place, very beautiful. My um, stepfather um, was actually heavily involved in the scouting movement um was um, a scout master of his own troop and then later central commission of the scouts so i was quite heavily involved in that myself and my dad um was a sailor um wow. so we'd go down the sailing and things and on. um after the divorce he actually got a boat and sailed around the mediterranean for a few years so my brother and i'd fly out and see him go 
was for holidays. So. Um, I think one of my friends, Lee True, when I met him, um, described it as a childhood full of knots. Um, and I was, I was out and about all the time. I was either sailing or I was climbing or I was sailing. Or hiking. Lots of hiking, lots of camping in the Lake District and the North Yorkshire Moors. Um, even just socially with my friends, teenagers, that's what we do, you know, to pass our time, to while away the weekends and join the holidays. We'd go on our own camping excursions to Malham Cove and um, learn to track and forage and uh, I learned a lot about um, the British wilderness over there which puts me a little fish out of water when I moved to Australia because all of a sudden it was wildly different and I had no idea about any of the trees here but um, it was definitely in the in, um, in the outdoors as a child. Mm. Mm. I think a lot about the difference between having role models and having mentors and I'm wondering about what you think about that. So I guess role models are just people who are doing it, like the people in your life, like your dad mm. sailing and you're watching. And then mentor, I guess, is someone who's specifically helping you through it, yeah. guiding you. I'm wondering your thoughts about role models and mentors and whether you need, whether young people specifically need mentors when it comes to nature, where it, nature awareness and nature connection. Um, well, the main challenge with nature connection and awareness, I see it, is that it's no longer a part of everyday life as it was from mm. our entire history up until a couple of hundred years ago. Um, it was just something you did. There was no word for it. You didn't need it. Um, a lot of the world's um, religions were focused around um, the sun, the moon, the, the plants, the crops, the animals, um, and we lived more in nature. But as technology has improved, we've removed ourselves from that. And so now it requires a conscious effort to go back to it. Um, and anything that requires conscious effort, I think, is benefited from role models and mentors. Um, it's, it's almost a shame and a sadness that it's required, that it isn't just found naturally like it used to be, you know, with our ancestors. Um, but the fact that it is out there and that there are movements and exercises of various different um, attitudes that can support people in that. Mm. So you live very close to me in Sanford, Queensland. Mm. I do. But people listening to this podcast come from all over the place. And I often ask my guests to describe nature around them, what they see when they step outside. And what you see is really similar to what I see. But I'd love for you to describe your experience of nature in this part of the world so that people listening can get a picture of what nature is like in southeast Queensland. Wow. I had to surmise that. Um very diverse. I'm just looking out the window at it now. It's yes. very diverse. It's very hardy. Um, I find it changes very quickly. Um, you'll be aware, of course, we've had an awful lot of rain in the, in the last mm. few weeks. And prior to that, there was lots of brown, lots of dead grass everywhere. And then just in a day or two of rain, it can turn on a sixpence and suddenly come lush and full and, and bountiful again. Um, so it really does spring back quickly, unlike um, some other parts of the world where the changes are a lot slower and more gradual. Um, again, as, as a native Englishman, it's very, very different to the English hills and countryside and a very different landscape and seeing all the eucalypts um, and the animal, the native animals, um, you know, the marsupials all very unique to um, not to Southeast Queensland necessarily, but to Australia. It, it's beautiful and diverse and rich and, and I learn every single day <laughs> um, mm. about new plants and, and animals, which is quite exciting. I'm still learning a lot. Mm. And your work has been partly uh, connecting people with nature. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little about your professional path or the path that led you to this place where you're <laughs> teaching people how to connect with nature. Sure. Well, as I said, um, my childhood was very connected to the outdoors and nature, primarily through the scouting movement and those kind of activity-based things. And so it all started when I got made redundant from my um, 
my core job in 2016 and I was looking for um, some other work and so I thought finally I should do I should work in an industry that I love so I put myself through a search in outdoor recreation bought some climbing and abseiling gear and um, decided to start my own business getting people outdoors and at the time I was considering just being outdoors just activity very scout-esque but just getting out there um, but actually it almost the act of doing this with no plan kind of changed me in that the more I was out there the more I was connecting to nature and realizing that the activity itself doesn't really do that it's the immersion that does that and so it was so rewarding taking little ones and um, like on like preschool age and six um and sometimes their parents through through the bush just watching the wonder of the child and it was so excited of every little thing and we were watching the seasonal changes and playing in the creek and i suddenly realized we don't actually need all this equipment all these activities mm -hmm. and so my business evolved not only with the kids but also going into adult education and um and teenagers into more the nature connection era and so i was reading lots of john young and um the eight shields um sort of institute that comes out of america I was connecting with a lot of nature connection mentors in australia i was very lucky to work with um lee true and gina trick trick down at um, blue gun bushcraft um, and through them a wealth of um other mentors and so that was um I was kind of learning on the job, so to speak, about shifting from my activities into um, more experiential um, response, which was which was really a cool thing to do. And now um, I'm working at a local school um, and bringing the same attitudes into um, into my teaching here, as we have an outdoor classroom and um, we get the children immersed and observing observing and experiencing I think are the two key tenets of, of nature awareness. And can you talk a little about bushcraft and what it means for people who might not have heard this term before? Yeah well bushcraft is a bit of a, a tricky one because it means different things in different places. There are many who promote the idea that bushcraft is a uniquely Australian term um, coined by um, some uh, Australian ex-military um, personnel from um, the last kind of 50 years or so um, about working with the bush, but it is used in, in America and in Europe as well. Um, some use it as kind of, or some assume it means survival, very bare grills, very kind of, you know, man versus wild, overcoming, um, etc. But the problem with that is survival by definition is temporary. Um, it's overcoming a short-term adversity in order to return to, you know, the real world. Um, and so survival techniques are short-term and locally focused. And they're often focused on overcoming nature as if nature's trying to, trying to get you. And nature just does yes. what it does. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so bushcraft, as I define it within my terms, and, and many others do as well, is... Um, the act of working with nature, the act of symbiosis and, um, you know, seeing the gifts that it give us, gives us, but harvesting, for example, only what one needs while still leaving, you know, enough of the timber or the fruit and be able to regrow and continue its population. Um, and we also look holistically um, I've written a kind of um, a curriculum for one of a better phrase that I use in my programs that looks at, it does have the skill sets that are very similar to survival. So you're not tying in your fire lighting and that's one portion, but there's also the connection to self, uh, which is done through the body and through the mind. Um, and there's a connection to each other through, because it's all looking long-term, whereas survival short-term, bushcraft mm. is long-term. So when you're looking long-term, um, no man is an island, you know, humans are, are kind of pack animals and we need each other. 
and so we have to learn how to get along and we have to have a certain amount of rules and a certain amount of history and understanding and storytelling and um, this is where all of that connection to community comes from and then the third aspect is connecting to nature itself and observation immersion um, it lends itself to the science of you know, you know study of insects and animals and plants and geography and topology and entomology and all those different um, different aspects of observing and classifying so I, I guess essentially I'm, I'm waffling a lot sorry but we have three core points we have the connection to nature the connection to self and the connection to community um, with a long-term sustainable focus as opposed to a short-term get out of jail focus um, yeah does that make sense <laughs> yeah that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> So you and I met several years ago when you reached out to me on Instagram and you saw what I was doing with nature journaling and how that overlaps with what you were doing with bushcraft. And at that time you were running monthly bushcraft sessions locally and I came to one of them with my young son and it was such a beautiful experience. And you had a space in the bush that you had set up what you called the village and each day you would start a fire put the billy on, have a, a sit around and a chat and, like you say, connect with community and and from there go off and do the bushcraft skills. And it was such an amazing thing. And one thing that jumps out to me is that my son, he was just one year old then, and he was often like he's always been a bit of an anxious kid and he often wants to leave places. We'll go somewhere and he'll straight away say, can we go home? And when he was in the village, he was so happy and he was so calm. And I just remember sitting and he would uh, sit with the other kids and there was very much uh, a community feel of it. And, and he didn't want to go. <laughs> he didn't want to go anywhere. He was just, it felt so yeah. natural to be there. It is. And it, it... You know, it's not um, accidental that it was named the village. It is a, a community thing, and I, I feel, it, and it, it supports an awful lot of the people who'd come to the programs, um, struggled with school, and were labelled with ADD or ADHD or the you know issues that we talk about today. Um, but I just think it's the most natural thing in, in the world to be with other humans in the trees and you know on the fields and just hanging out yes. and. Um, through that process you can see the tasks that need to be done well let's let's get a billy on or let's cook some damp or let's light a fire let's build a shelter um all these things become natural activities that one goes it doesn't have to be set into a structure of okay we're gonna learn how to tie knots today and then we'll build it and then we'll do this and then we'll do that that's um, a very modern construct um, and it doesn't work for all age groups you know some age groups really want to get involved in the technicalities particularly the adults really wanted to learn all these skills but really just hanging out and working together and one of the beauties of that program that you just described was having one-year-olds and having grandparents yes. and having that mix yes. of ages which again was very natural and very much in our in our dna yes. and our ancestry that we don't do so much anymore it's everybody lives in their own little siloed home and they get educated in their within their age group and that whole leadership comes just by being an older more responsible child um, or from little ones talking to grandparents doesn't happen um, as fluidly as it used to you know like you go see nana maybe every weekend or every second weekend that's it it's not they're not around just socially all the time and so i really think people responded to that program with their innate um, joy of just being together and hanging out <laughs> yes Yes, I agree. It was there was something so magical about it, and in fact, you gave me my very first chance to uh, give a nature journaling workshop. You were amazing. It was wonderful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was so nervous, but then again, it was such a supportive, amazing group that I just brought paints and pens, and I set everyone up with them, and we just nature journaled what we saw around us and it was one of the most beautiful the perfect lead-in for me because it was so supportive and so wonderful but then it was just this joy it was just a joy as nature journaling workshops always are but I just will always remember that the opportunity you gave to me but also just the the fun that it was to 
all these pens and pencils going at the same yeah. time and everyone with heads down and focused and I just remember and it so clearly so in. and I remember um the your work anybody listening to this podcast I'm sure has seen your Instagram and seen how incredible your work is um and it was so beautiful I don't have the same natural gift to artistry um so I was very keen to um I, I've never been one in any of my programs to just do it all. We again, we all have different skill sets and strengths in our life. Everybody should experience it all, and I do draw and journal myself. But um, it's nice. Like I'd get experts in who knew a lot about bush tucker and different aspects, um, because it's not all you know about me. And um, when I saw your work, it just fit so beautifully. And after you came down with Amory that time, um, it was just beautiful. And you, I remember you were so nervous. I was. <laughs> and I knew it would be fine because you just do what you do. And that's what you've done for many, many years before, you know, you touch base and ever since. Um, so I had no real doubts or worries. It was a very low key, very informal thing, wasn't it? And everybody just flocked to your um your ability and your manner um it was just beautiful and i remember we had some of my current year 12 students as well as some little ones under six and every single one of them was invested and somebody brought some poetry out that's what i loved about it that everyone was um doing it together but in their own way and it didn't matter if you were a grown-up or a teenager or a little one mm. everyone was there doing their own thing and it just fills my heart up just to yeah, remember likewise, it. Likewise, <laughs> likewise, you brought such a, a special, um, you know, ethos to that meeting. It was fabulous. <laughs> Tell me about the connection between bushcraft and nature journaling. So, in bushcraft, you develop knife skills and practice firelighting and remote first aid and sh shelter making. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts about why nature journaling is is an important bushcraft skill, just like these mm. other skills. It exists in a lot of different areas. Um, so on the one hand, nature journaling at its core is, is observation. It's dirty and observation. It's just mm -hmm. looking at what's there with no judgment, no preconceived ideas. Um, but it's looking really, really detailed um, at a leaf. And it's something that often is difficult to get through to kids, particularly teenagers. Um, you ask them to describe a landscape and say, what do you see in that one? trees so okay <laughs> you know yeah. what types of trees how many different shades of green are there what's in the distance what's near are there any animal oh there's a bird up there okay what's the bird doing the bird circling well, why are they doing that is it just a bit of fun oh well they're, they're probably looking for something or well, what are they looking for um, and it's this continual questioning that helps you understand the world there was um a wonderful first nations lady who visits our school a lot called Millie Wallace Sandy. um who described to me her childhood in Arnhem Land. And she spoke once of um, when she was a child, she wasn't allowed down to the creek to play if the wattle was in bloom. Um, and the indicator was that when the wattle bloomed at the same time that the crocodiles were nesting. And the crocodiles are an invisible danger because they were under the water and they're yes. under the water, but they're obviously fiercely protected at this time. But the waddle was a visible indicator of this hidden danger. Um, and yes. so, but you can only get that knowledge through observing, through understanding, because they're not necessarily causal. You know, the crocodile doesn't necessarily look at the waddle and go, oh, waddle's out, time to lay the eggs, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they don't have to be causal, but if, the, if, there's a, if there's a relationship, then we can see that. We can only do that mm. from slowing down and from observing. And so you don't only, it's not solely about making pretty pictures, it's about understanding the world, it's about understanding the web of, you know, the food web, the, the cycles, the animals, how things are interconnected, which is paramount to understanding the bush. Um, yeah, yes. and it fits into obviously the scientific era of, you know, um, botany and, and um, entomology and things that, you know, that all starts with observation and questions and the more detail you get into and labeling the parts of an ant or, you know, whatever. Um, and the final aspect, I'd say that's all very nature connection, but the other part is it slows you down your own head and your own time 
and is very cathartic and meditative process which is important if you're going to spend a lot of time in nature you need to be slow and observing and um, in our fast-paced world there's always a time there's always the end of this activity and the start of the next and we're constantly moved through life um, just whisked on to the next thing whereas the ability to stop and take stock and observe and feel um, is really good for our mental health in fact the japanese and forgive me if i don't pronounce this correctly um shinrin yoku is a um a japanese art of translates as forest bathing and mainstream doctors actually prescribe forest bathing as um as a medicine as a medicinal technique to help people with anxiety and depression and a number of other um issues that they may have just go out and spend time in nature like it, it it's known as a as a um, very practical thing to do. Yes, I love that about nature journaling. It sort of spans everything, it you does. know. Like you described, um, you described like knowledge and connection with self, connection with community, and nature journaling does all that. You know, it it feeds the mind, it connects you with nature, it connects you with yourself, and. And look yeah. at that community you started when we came into the village, you know, and everybody of all different ages were all journaling together and they were drawing different things. Yes. But then they were looking at each other's jour journals and saying, oh, you, you saw that yeah. colour or you got that leaf. Or, Where did that plant come from? Oh, I found it over there. I never even knew that was growing over there. And then I think one of the old, older members identified the plant said oh that's such and such you can eat that and oh really i didn't yes. know that now all of a sudden we've found a place in our space that nobody knew this plant was and now we did and that we could eat it and um, just came from that art of journaling as a as a community it was beautiful yeah yeah so special mm. developing bushcraft skills can lead people to feel stronger and safer and more connected to nature in, in their place in nature. And I love the way it's for everyone, like we talked about, like even very young children. And I love how children are given skills like fire lighting, like knife skills that might be considered dangerous by some people, but I feel like letting them develop these skills in early life makes them safer and more confident. And I'm wondering your thoughts on this about young young children with knives and fire <laughs> it's great we all love knives and fire it's um i think it leads to the culture uh, or it talks to the culture of low expectations um if i can give an analogy to many um kindergartens um for example i have plastic uh, and pubs and things frankly have plastic cups for children with water because children knock things over and they spill things and they don't want the plastic so the easy solution, it's an engineering solution, is to provide a plastic cup that doesn't break, and then the problem goes away. But the problem that they add in is that this this child doesn't become aware that there's a cup there, and so it gets knocked over more often. <laughs> and so yes, you don't get broken glass, sure, but you still get lots of spilled water and knocked over cups. Whereas the kindergarten at our school um, has each child choose their own porcelain mug and they go on a special shopping trip with their parent and they say, oh, I want that one. That's amazing. It's got purple dots on it or it's got a picture of a duck on it or whatever it is. And they, absolutely, and they bring it in, their name gets written on it. They're like, this is my cup. Mm. And we, the kindergarten here creates that um, sense of connection to the cup. And very, very few breakages. You know, with, with four classes mm. of you know, 25 um, under sixes in each class, <laughs> Um, and there's very few breakages in the one child when there is a breakage that child is so sad they really didn't want yes. their special cup to break and nobody wants to be you know they all have this empathy for for that child and nobody wants to have mm. their cup broken and the child obviously gets a replacement gets talked to and it's fine it moves on but it happens once or twice a year if that just the kids don't knock it over because they're paying attention and it's the same thing with fire and with knives you obviously have to bring it appropriately and bring the safety in. We don't teach fire lighting without also teaching fire extinguishing and proper fire management. Um, we don't teach, I don't actually teach knife use until um, the age of nine, like properly, just because mm -hmm. um, the wrist strength isn't actually fully developed until 
the age of nine, so earlier years can use like, like potato peelers are a really good way of stripping bark off um, off green wood. And um, that's a great way of getting the action of knife work without the super detail, but it provides focus as whittling, um, mm. focus on an idea and the safety. And if you get tired, you just put it down and move on. And when kids are given this trust with these skills, they often raise to um, to being responsible with them. And if they don't, then, you know, there's obviously safety protocols in place. And that's not how we use knives. Hand it over. And, you know, <laughs> maybe they can come back to it when they're a little time later in the day. Or, but no, it's definitely mm-hmm. valuable to, to give them that responsibility, I think. I think it's the same thing with people hovering too much at the playground for example like um when a child wants to climb and the parent says come down come down they're sort of not giving them the skills to to know when to stop or what's safe and what's not and so with my little one I say to him what does your body what does your body say and he always says my body says yes or my body says no and the body Mm -hmm. knows and I I feel like when we give kids a little bit of experience with something, they can really find where the safety mm-hmm. limit is. Uh, that's the that's the, tenet, the theory of risky play. Um, Megan Hines uh, said if you if children don't um, experience risk, they can't know how to manage it. Um, things mm. like oh, I remember. Um, a family I was talking to, they had one of those old school trampolines that like we all had in the 70s and 80s with, you know, no walls and exposed springs. And yeah, yeah. And it was like yeah, a yeah. rectangle, <laughs> really old trampoline. And they had some cousins yeah. come and visit who were used to the new type that was circular and it had the, the walls around it and all the rest of it. Um, and they were terrified of it because they're so used to mm. being in the safe bubble that can bounce around all over the place. Um, without any risk, that when they got on that main tramp, that big trampoline, they're like, hang on, where are the walls? What if my foot goes down there? Whereas the same mm-hmm. age kids who'd grown up with this, they knew how to manage it and they could bounce perfectly safely. And occasionally there might be an accident, you know, that, and they, you know, have a few minutes of being hurt and being upset and then they get back on there again. And and they bounce that little bit differently as they learn to manage it. Um, And so, yeah, it's definitely um, a skill set that's lacking in our world because even play parks, just in my uni assignment the other day, we were looking at a play park from the 60s, which had these big, tall climbing frames that were like, you know, four metres high or something. Um, And then they showed you a modern (laughs) playground um, that won't go above 1.8. And it's just like, wow, how we, we don't trust the children anymore to make their own decisions and sure people have made bad decisions and there have been big injuries from taking risks um that is a danger um i admit but for the most part the majority of people learn a lot from those risky adventures mm-hmm. so you talked about uh working in a local mm. school and the school is the waldorf school and I know that both nature and art are really big part of the Waldorf tradition. Can you talk a little about that, about nature and art and how they're integrated in the school where you work? Where sure. you work? Well, the main concept of the Steiner or Waldorf um, pedagogy is to develop the human being, the whole human being. Many mainstream schools largely focus on, on knowledge um, and uh, passing tests and getting jobs. We also, we still have the same gratified curriculum that meets with the Australian curriculum, but um, we hold music and art and um, physical education and the academic subjects at equal standing. Um, So a lot of the time the art is brought into the academic subject. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of an example. So in biology, we don't use textbooks where children just copy um, or get a photocopy of a, of the skeleton, say, and say, label these bones. The students have to draw the skeleton. And this comes back to nature journaling. So they're actually, they're looking at a, at a skeleton. Either we, we have a plastic one that's real life. We also have ones we project onto the wall. To make it 
and they have to draw the shape of every bone and the the observation just like with nature journey the observation of that bone really cements its shape and its place in the body yes. and its length and proportion with regards to other bone and then it's labeled um and it helps cement their memory and it helps them understand the names um and they come out with these beautiful books that are essentially they're writing their own textbook but you know they, they write words to describe their pictures and they use art to cement those um those understandings and those the there's a big underlying philosophy that emotion aids memory retention and we all know this from any kind of any time you've been particularly happy or sad or um, a song you love comes on the radio or you know these things are easier to remember than the more dead memories for one of a better phrase um what did you have for breakfast yesterday last week maybe you don't really recall that but if it was the best breakfast ever or i was in this but i remember i was eating breakfast one day and suddenly a car plowed through the window and i got this massive fright you'll remember what you were eating not that it's relevant to the car coming through but you'll remember that yes. because yes. That, that emotion aids the memory retention and so we try and work with emotion primarily joy and laughter if we can but also experience that sense of being wowed and shocked you know you show them an experiment which is contrary to what they think would happen like, how did that happen and then they go through the way of figuring it out um and it's all down to observation and, and artistry and connecting all the dots of a human being not just the cerebral nature I love that focus on emotion. That's so rare. It's not something that we do generally in in our daily lives. You know, I, I, I guess like emotion, the word emotion. Oh, you're too emotional, or you're too sensitive, or you're too. <laughs> so this, you negative. know, it's not. It's not a. Mm. Yeah, like it's seen as a negative, or we don't really talk about emotions in that way. But I love that. That's one of the core teaching yeah. styles it's well beautiful. and it's not um it's not like an out there concept so um, there's there's many psychological papers that have been written um to support yes. that and in fact if we look into ancestry and ancient history the pre-christian anglo-saxons um how the same word for motion and a memory they didn't actually distinguish between the two oh, um, interesting. which i found fascinating really. I saw some pictures you had posted about the Waldorf 100 Australia Youth Conference and it looked like an amazing event. It and great. so the young people, the young participants were making their own pigments from earth materials and making their own brushes and pens and then using these materials to draw and paint nature around them. I'd love for you to talk a little more about these sessions. Oh, it was fantastic. So to celebrate 100 years of, of the pedagogy, we were lucky enough at our school to host um, a youth conference where years 11 and 12, year 11 and 12 students from Steiner schools around the country um, all came down here and they camped out in our oval. And we had two or three days of activities and keynote speakers and alumni. Um, and it was all run by the youth for the youth. Uh, our alumni were still in their 20s who were doing the keynote speeches. It wasn't about the adults dictating. Um, it was about them um, going in the direction they wanted to go. There was lots of wonderful conversations. Um, but my part in that was uh, I was working with another colleague of mine, Chris Wood Willems, um, and we wanted to bring some nature connection uh, into the program. And so we used our outdoor classroom and made inks and paints by boiling up different um, bark and um, very much like eco dyeing, but we just refine it a little more. There was berries, tea, silky oak, blueberry. Um, there was a number of different inks, and I took the students through making charcoal as well, charcoal pencil. Um, and then they, we made some quills out of bamboo and some charcoal holders, um, which are like uh, like a clutch pencil. Um, mm -hmm. out of bamboo and it holds a piece of charcoal um, and some of them did chewed paintbrushes um, and found some grasses and bound them onto sticks and things like this and they were just left to creatively see what was around them and I challenged them with painting a tree with itself um, so they had to then use the colors extracted from the leaves and the bark or the charcoal to paint what 
it was that made the ink in this like cyberpunk thing. And we got some beautiful, beautiful results. So uh, like you say, there's a few pictures on my Instagram there. Again, some people leaning towards poetry. Um, some were very abstract, like a super close up of the tree trunk, just all the different colours they yes. saw in, in this Euclid ray gun. And others kind of backed up a little more and were just painting the whole landscape of a tree in the lantern and the asparagus vine. But they were all using um, quills and um, charcoal that they made themselves and inks that they processed from the bush around them. So it was a wonderful few hours. It was great. That sounds absolutely magical. I feel like I'm, I'm thinking back to that first workshop I did for you at Sun and Stars Bushcraft and there yep. was, as you said, there was some older students from the Steiner School there and one of them... Mm -hmm. She she sat with us and she did the exercise and she was nature journaling with us. And when I looked at her page, my jaw just dropped down because it was she had <laughs> she'd done this beautiful picture. She'd added color. She'd labeled it. She'd done a description of it and she had written a po a little poem about it. And I said to her, "Whoa, hang on, you've done this before." And she said. <laughs> yeah this is normal for us like it like nature journaling was just part of their yeah. everyday normal life and i just thought that was so cool <laughs> well that's also not just nature but what you saw there was what we call a main lesson book that's what we teach so whatever subject it is whether it's history or geography or music or art or science or whatever whatever they're studying is is drawn is written about mm. in its technical capacity and often about um, in a poetic capacity as well, one in some form or another, um, and they use colour and they create everything again. They don't get given worksheet after worksheet that they make notes on or copy out of the blank. Sometimes we can do that because we still have you know learning needs as any other school does, but generally um, every page is very artistic, and mm -hmm. bordered and full, and it all goes to slow them. It's very similar to nature journal. They slow mm -hmm. down. They pay attention to what they're doing. They're focused on the detail. They write things in their own words, say, of an experiment observation rather than copying um, the teacher's words or the textbook's words. Um, and again, just that act of creating their own words helps with the retention and understanding of the topic as well. So, yeah, what you saw was essentially a, a lesson page. <laughs> it's just ingrained in them. <laughs> so my cousins were educated through Steiner as well and they moved to South Australia to be yeah. closer to the high school there and yeah. my aunt uh, did a lot of work and she did some she took some students uh, she was a helper on the botany camps and she described the botany camps and essentially she said they go out for two weeks and they sit in the bush with a notebook and they do nature journaling and it was <laughs> it was incredible to hear her description of it and yeah, what an incredible gift to these kids to immerse them like this in nature, in nature connection, in art. And, yeah, it was it was wonderful to hear her description of the botany camp. Yeah, our botany camp isn't two weeks. It's just one. We go to Fraser Island. Um, we're so fortunate in southeast Queensland to have such diversity and so many places that are unique within the world. Um, we do geomorphology on... Um, South Stradbrook with the Kwandamooka peoples down there. There's the largest um, sand dune in the Southern Hemisphere is down there that they get to sketch and experience. And yeah, the, the diversity of um, plant life on Fraser Island is um, remarkable. They, they're essentially yeah, just nature journey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously they have the science behind it all, um, but it, all science starts with observation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love how it's all integrated, science, art, connection, you know, writing, mathematics. It sounds like it's all blended into one, and I think that's how it's supposed to be and how we learn as human beings. Well, they don't exist in in silos, you know. You can't have science without maths. And, you, and the early, um, even if you look at Darwin, his, he started sketching, you know, on the... Um, yes. When he was in South America or wherever it was, here, Central America, he was sketching the animals and birds and things that you saw there. And I, well, you know, your your background was um, was in that field. Yeah. Am I right? 
Yeah, I uh, studied ecology and conservation biology, and my um, very first nature journal was <laughs> was a field journal. Yeah. Yeah, um, and this this is where. And archaeologists, you know, they need to sketch their, their landscape and their pits and the things they find there. And nowadays we've got photographs and things that can take a lot of this away, but the core essence is, is all still journaling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, It's been such a joy to talk to you, Andy. Thank you for exploring all these things with me, revisiting some memories. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's been wonderful. I love the podcast. And yeah, and you, you know, you, I love that this has developed into what it's come. You're doing so such wonderful things with the, you know, the International Nature Journaling Week and the podcast. And um, it's so wonderful to see you just currently flying in this area. It's, it's, it's a true you. service. It's wonderful. And I think back all, regularly, I think back to that opportunity you gave me and that beginning what a beautiful place to begin and I appreciate it so much I think about oh, that good. often actually <laughs> you help me and um, you know just you've got to be opportunities are nothing if you don't take them mm -hmm. you know um, there's a lot of people that turn down opportunities out of fear or nerves or what if I'm not good enough but you were courageous enough to step in despite all of that and um, <laughs> look where it's led you it's you've done so mm -hmm. much work it's amazing Thank you, Andy. It's been a joy. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview with Andy. I loved his insight that you don't need to be doing activities in nature as much as just experiencing immersion in nature to become connected. So when he was talking about the village he created through his bushcraft workshops, that's what we were doing. We were sitting together in nature and it didn't matter what the activity was. Being there together was what was important. I love listening to Andy talk about how deeply rooted both art and nature are in the Steiner School where he now works. There are so many reasons to connect with nature and it makes me happy to speak about them with Andy and with you. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can support it by giving it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. You can also support Journaling with Nature with a small monthly donation, as little as $1 a month, on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash journalingwithnature to learn more about that. Thank you to those patrons who are already supporting the podcast this way. It helps so much to keep this project viable in the long term. I hope you know how much I appreciate that. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm -hmm.